And so let's jump into this whole thing and kind of think about some of the therapeutic goals that we have in working with people. Um, one of my favorite authors, and some people know of her, I, I think she's an unheralded genius, is Dr. Karen Horney, And she was uh, trained in classic psychoanalysis and became a Neo-Freudian and was really the first person to recognize the power of, of our relationships in terms of our development. Freud was focused very much on his theory that was connected to the libido and that energy, but she really talked about our desire to be loved, to be accepted, and to belong is a real driving force, and that force did a lot of different things, and one of the things it did, it created an anxiety that we weren't going to be loved and accepted, and that then you know, forced us to develop some kind of a resolution to that anxiety. And in the resolution, the solution, what she called a basic solution, was to come up with this idea of who we needed to be to be loved and accepted and to belong. And that was the idealized self. And she talks about the aim of therapy is to help a person abandon their drive to actualize the idealized self and to move more towards self-realization. In fact, that's one way I talked about recovery from addiction a lot as the recovery of our lost true self. But for today's talk, I want you to think about our work is trying to help a person recover their interest in themselves. You see, what happens a lot of times is that as we're going through life, our, our personality becomes fixed because of whatever solutions we had to what I talked about before, the, the formation of that idealized self. And so when I decided who I had to be, that became an absolute for me. So if my solution was to, she talks about moving against people, moving towards people and moving away from people. If my solution was to move away from people, she called it the attitude of, of freedom, if I didn't want to have any wants or needs, then I'm going to be fixed around that issue. And what happens when I live in that kind of a way, because I'm in a rut, right, that, that this is the only way that I know how to function, we kind of lose an interest in ourselves because there's no creativity in our life. There's no spontaneity. We become automatons in our life. And one way of thinking about the work we're doing is engaging people in such a way as that we stimulate them in becoming interested in themselves again. And we do that by helping them discover new possibilities. And I hope today's talk is going to help you see how you can do that. So let's talk about creativity and psychotherapy and let's look at the creative therapist. This is, a, I think, a good working definition. The creative therapist is experimental. They're not conventional, which means that you're going to try different things on. And the other way of thinking about it is that you're going to be different depending on who's in your office. The creative therapist has the ability to use themselves, their humor or their wit or the client and the energy from the client, or if you're running a group or a family or the objects in your room and the environment in the service of inventing novel visions. New narratives, you can think of it, right? New ways of thinking about the person's relationship to themselves, to the problem they're having, to the people in their life, and even to life itself, right? New visions for that, for that person, that family, or that group. Dr. Zinker wrote Creative Processes in Gestalt Therapy in 1977, a brilliant, brilliant Gestalt therapist. And he said this, he said, psychotherapy is the, a lively process of stroking the client's inner fires of awareness and contact. It involves exchanges of energy with the client, exchanges which stimulate and nourish the other person, but do not deplete the therapist's own vitality and power. And this is a very important thing, is that we need to show up in therapy as where that encounter is giving us something as well as it's giving something to our client. I've been doing therapy with people now for over 46 years and I'm still 
as interested, if not more interested and excited about the opportunity when I'm going to engage in someone because I never know what's going to happen in the course of a therapy session. It's unpredictable. This is Dr. Irv and Marion Polster. The Irv is still around, but Marion passed away a number of years ago. They were the clinical directors of the Gestalt Institute in San Diego. And when they talk about using experiments in psychotherapy, they talk about them as they're used to expand the range of the individual, showing him or her how he can extend his habitual sense of boundary. So remember before when I said, when we come up with a solution to this basic anxiety, that that solution is going to result in some very fixed or stereotyped behavior. You know, let's say my solution to dealing with uncertainty is to always say no to things. Well, now I'm fixed around being no. So when we talk about extending our habitual sense of boundary, we're talking about that other person that's always a no, experimenting with being yes and to see what it feels like to say a yes in his or her life. But that's what it looks like. And so what we're going to be thinking about is all of these, this, these interventions I'm going to be talking about is expanding the range of the individual's experience in their life and in in discovering new possibilities in terms of how they cope with what's going on in their life. This is my mentor, Dr. Templer, and uh, that's at his home, and or it was at his home in Grava, Holland. Uh, where I spent a good month on a, a, as um, a sabbatical with him and becoming in, uh, introduced to the Kempler Institute in Europe, which I was, was a member of the international training staff for a long time. But Dr. Kempler talked about therapy in this way. He says, being therapeutic means helping one another discover the words which most accurately and thoroughly reflect us in the moment and providing an atmosphere that gives the needed courage to say them. So that's what we're kind of doing is it's kind of a search and discover and, and reveal atmosphere. So what we want to do to do that, we have to create a safe emergency for the person, which means we want to invite the person to, be on, to go beyond their comfort zone and to really start to push themselves in directions that they would not normally push themselves, but with a safety net underneath them, right? That we're going to be there to help give them support that they need to do, to experience whatever they're going to be experienced. And the rule of thumb in terms of the kind of support we give was really wonderfully described by Dr. Laura Pearls, who was uh, Fritz Pearl's wife and co-founder of Gestalt Therapy. She said, give your clients as much support as necessary, but as little as possible. So there's that fine dance that's always taking place between encouraging people to push themselves, get out there, and for us to support them, but to let them experience what it feels like to stand on their own two feet and to discover their own ground in life. This is Gary Yontef. He's a Gestalt therapist here in uh, the Los Angeles area. And he goes, the attitude for experiment in Gestalt therapy is to try something new and be aware of and notice what you experience as you're trying it on. So this becomes the essence of the kind of work we do in this approach to psychotherapy is we really, it's the basis of our work is to increase a person's awareness of what they're experiencing. And awareness can be in and of itself curative a lot of times. So that's what we want to do. The essence is let's try this on and see what happens. I'm going to show you a demonstration later on in, in this program today that will show that. But what blocks us in terms of creativity? We're our fear of failure. We're afraid that we're going to make a mistake or that we might do something that, that won't be useful or won't be helpful. But remember, in, in that what we want to do is we really want to model for our patients the same behavior we want them to be able to adopt in their life to function better. So if I'm afraid of failing as I introduce an experiment, what am I going to do? I'm going to share that with them. I'm going to say, you know, I'm a little concerned about how this might play out. But, you know, I'd like to take that risk. Are you willing to do it? Let's try it. 
the reluctance to play, to be silly and stuff like that. Well, once again, if I'm feeling that, I want to own that. Resource myopia. And that means is that I've got blinders on, that I don't see other possibilities, other things that might be useful. Um, I remember once doing a training group and I'm working with someone doing the clinical demonstration. And then I had that person I was working with turn to the students in the group and interact with them. Now, if before I had the idea that I could not use the group in that therapeutic way, then I would be blocking myself from being aware of some possibilities that were in at that moment with that intervention, it was very helpful. Over certainty is, is needing to feel certain all the time, needing to feel that this, this needs to be the way that things are done, that I've got to be certain that this is going to have this result. And a lot of times with these experiments, we're not going to know what the result is and not, nor should you be planning it. The experiment is to see what happens. Let's see what goes on. Frustration avoidance, right? Feeling like you want to avoid being frustrated or, or creating a situation where you're stuck. But once again, all of these things are things that can be grist for the therapeutic mill. Some other blocks to creativity is being custom bound, only working a certain way, an impoverished fantasy life, not letting yourself fantasize when you're sitting with that person and getting some images about what, what might be going on, the fear of the unknown, the need for balance in this section, the reluctance to exert your influence over the person or to take charge. Some other blocks is a reluctance to let go, an impoverished emotional life that we haven't done our own work and expanded our own possibilities, being unintegrated in many areas of our life, a sensory dullness, meaning that we have holes in being able to see, hear, feel, or speak certain things to a client. Can you say something that, that makes you very uncomfortable to say to a person? And, and how you say that to that person. Say, God, I want to say something to you, but I'm not so sure you're going to want to hear it. Can I experiment and say it to you and let's see what happens? That You can find a way to share yourself in that way. What are some of the work-related characteristics of the creative therapist? Well, a good sense of timing is knowing when to bring your intervention in, the capacity to detect where the person can be reached and energized and moved emotionally. I, I like to think about this as being relevant, is being able to really tune into what's the most important thing that's going on with a person. A knowledge of where the psychological buttons are and, and when to push them in a session. The ability to shift gears, to let go of some things and move on to other things that are more lively areas. I mean, you can really tell if a session is going well is because there will be a certain kind of vitality and energy to it that tells you you're heading in the right direction. Some of the other work-related characteristics is the willing to push someone, confront someone, cajole, persuade, energize the person to get the work done. The wisdom to know what to let the person stay confused and to sit in that confusion so that he or she may learn to evolve their own clarity. Now, a good way to start to think about this stuff is that our, obviously our brain, while well, it's, it's, it's a whole brain, right? Our brain functions in a holistic way, but there are different what we call, you know, hemisphere uh, localizations. So if you're right-handed, then the left hemisphere is going to be much more analytical, control focused. It's going to have language. It's going to be sequential. It's going to go for certainty, intellectual. While your right hemisphere is the more artistic, spatial part, there's where wonder, being playful, where you look at things in, in the wholeness of them. There's going to be spontaneity coming out of there, imagery, intuition. And so what we're talking about is that the creative therapist is really going to be able to use both of these modes of consciousness. They're going to use their right hemisphere and their left hemisphere, and they're going to move back and forth between the two of them. So the left hemisphere is going to be grabbing hold of something and staying focused on it, whereas the right hemisphere, you're going to hang loose and see what happens. In the beginning of a session, I'm really in my hanging loose mode. I ask a person to start with what's most important for to them. What do they want to change about themselves? 
at this particular moment in time in their life. And then I hang loose and see how they talk about it. I pay attention to the language they're using. And then as I do that, eventually I get a hold of something in Gestalt therapy and the work training I do, we call it, I define, I get a hold of the working point. And now I start to bring that working point in, I engage them, but then at times I will back off and watch how they're working with what I'm talking about. The left hemisphere is gonna analyze the particulars, whereas the right hemisphere is gonna see the whole uh, gestalt at the same time. Um, it was interesting in the emotional sobriety meeting that, that um, Keith had referred to last night, Dr. John Amodeo shared, uh, he was our 15 minute leader and the meetings structured where there's somebody shares for 15 minutes about some aspect of emotional sobriety. And then, you know, we open it up for a discussion. Everybody gets, anybody that wants to share gets three minutes to share. Well, one person says, God, you know, I'm having such a hard time with this idea because the topic yesterday was receiving. And he says, you know, I, I seem to have a lot of trouble that in relationships. I hope I'm not going with what you, against what you said, Dr. Amadeo. But, you know, my problem is I take, I take, I take, I take, and I keep wanting more and more and more. And he says, well, how does that work with this receiving thing? And, you know, John made some comment to them. And then I stepped in and says, well, taking is very different than receiving. Is that when he, when you talk about it, and this is the feedback I gave to him, your taking is very demanding. Receiving, there's no demand taking place. It's an openness. You're allowing something to happen to you. So that was kind of analyzing the particulars in that moment. That's an example of that. Sometimes we're taking control. Other times we're flowing with the process that's happening in the session. I like to think about, I really lead the session from behind, meaning that I'm always taking the cues from what's going on with the patient to, in terms of following them, and seeing where we need to go. Being certain and then allowing oneself to experience confusion. There's gonna be a time of session where I don't know what the heck's gonna happen with the exercise that we're doing or with the experiment, but I'm gonna go ahead and let it flow because I have faith that if we stay with it, something important is gonna evolve. Sometimes I can be incredibly serious. Other times I can be sitting there, you know, having bringing my sense of humor in. And I think you'll see some of that in the demonstration we're gonna to get to here shortly. Being curious and allowing oneself to float in dullness, experiencing wants sequentially and then experience things as a whole, naming things and seeing spatial imagery, being intellectual and then attending to intuition. So that's all to, uh, good and said, but let me show you this demonstration. Um, and then I'll talk about a few things and then we'll open up some things for some questions. Trauma is a very important issue in terms of addressing with someone who's trying to establish their recovery. Oftentimes, the experiences that traumatize someone undermine that person's ability to be sincere with themselves. In this session, you're going to see me work with a woman who had severe trauma growing up with two alcoholic parents. In fact, one of the parents left at the age of 13. And she was with her mother who was also alcoholic and then she left at 16 and she became a ward of the court but through that whole time growing up she was beaten and verbally abused now in addition to all of the the damage that that creates there's a characterological adaptation to it too like a person now takes on that role and starts to do to themselves what was done to them so in this session, you're going to see me work with the introjects, these terrible messages that this young woman received from her parents and that have now become her own voice. If I'm successful, I'm going to be able to rally some of the resources within her, maybe that she has, or maybe we're going to have to invoke some of those so that she can start to deal with that part of her in a different way. Remember, recovery is the discovery of new possibilities. Hi, Rhea. I'm Dr. Berger. 
Okay. Look, what this is about, it's some time for us to work together. And what I'd like to focus on is where you're struggling the most in your life today. I want to take a history right now because it's, it's, uh, if we can look at what's happening now, I think that's going to be the point that we can have the biggest impact and I can have the biggest impact on what's going on for you. So what I'd like to start with is what you want to change about yourself, where you find yourself at an impasse or what you're struggling with. I um, we have some idea what that might be, don't we? I do. What is it? Yeah. I have a hard time staying sober. Mm -hmm. uh, I drink too much, basically. I don't know when to stop. And I, I'll i have a couple of months or even a few weeks where I'm good and I'm not drinking. Mm -hmm. And then I have, uh, I, I get very critical of myself. And I get extremely negative, which takes me to this low that just, I have to drown that voice out. And the only way to drown it out is to be drunk. And so the only way that you know how to deal with that part of yourself, that's it's safe to call that part highly critical. Is that what you, you were saying how critical it is? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the only way you know how to deal with that is, is to, to drink, right? To shut it off. Yeah, because then I'm just, then I, I'm numb, so I don't well, hear, the, hear anything. Yeah. So that just tells me how harsh that voice must be, that if it's creating that much pain in you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's really bad. Huh? Look, I think what would be helpful is see, I want to separate you from that part of yourself from that critical, harsh part that goes after you. Because the issue is, is yes, you have that part of you, but how you cope with that part becomes very important, right? Until you, in, in, in your ability to be able to support your recovery. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over here right now, okay? And so in that chair, okay, in that chair over there is gonna be the part of you that criticizes you. Okay. That really goes after you. So I want you to move over to this side real quick. And this is the rest of you. So come on over here. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So go ahead and let her have it. Criticize her. What, what do you think about Rhea? Tell her directly. Rhea, uh, I you, you're pretty useless. Uh, you're, you weren't smart enough to even complete medical school. You weren't, um, you can't seem to hold a single relationship because nobody wants you. And why would anybody want you? Because you're not attractive. You can't, I mean, look at you. You've got weight issues. You've got eating issues. You've got all sorts of problems. And, um, I just, you're despicable. There's not a single thing that I can like about you. You're disgusted with her. Yes. Say that to her. I'm disgusted with her. I'm disgusted with you, Rhea. This part is very harsh. Come on over here, Rhea. Let's see how I want to see how you respond to that part of you. <laughs> uh, it's really it's really mean and I try. I try so hard. I, I am. I guess I am a failure. I'm just, um, so you, can't manage. Yeah. So you, you you try to push back, but you were unable to support it. It's like you agree with her, Leah. You do, huh? Tell her that you're right. I'm no good. I'm worthless. Do that for follow that for a minute. You're right about everything that you said about me. Uh, I'm worthless. I don't have any value, and um, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I'm disgusting. I'm, I'm, I'm disgusting. I'm a worthless, pathetic. 
Oh, I'm stupid. Okay, now back here now. We'll be, be the harsh part of you again. What do you say to her? She's agreeing with you. Well, of course you're going to agree with me. I mean, look, look at you. You sulk around all day long. You cry. You're whiny. Um, I'm not pitiful. Pitiful. She's yeah, pitiful. Yes, so you're pitiful. You're pitiful. You're a disgrace. You're, I just can't even look at you. I mean, you're just... <laughs> Thank you. What do you say that? That I am. That I. Um, yeah. But you make it really hard, so it's not all my fault. Um, and every time I try to have a good day, you bring me back down. You really don't know how to deal with her, do you? I see exactly the dilemma that you're facing, that she has such unquestionable or unquestioned authority in your life. All you can do is try to mount some kind of resistance, but it's not very strong, you know? It's not. Yeah. So there's just a very small part of you that disagrees with her, isn't there? Not much of one at all. Just a small. Yeah. Well, well, boy, you sure put your finger on it. You know, when this happens, you don't know how to cope with it. And I can see where that sets you up to say, wow, I might as well take a drink. I mean, what's the matter anyway? I'm hopeless. I can't have a better life. Right. You see, it just fills into that, that whole or it, it follows, right? It goes right into that whole thing about it. I might as well pick up a drink. It makes it easier. Yeah, well, it's, it's like it's the only kind of sense of relief you have, but it's, even a picking up a drink is a way of agreeing with her again. You see, that's the dilemma of this. Even what you're trying to do to support yourself ends up agreeing with her, reinforcing what she's saying to you. What we say is that the Consciousness that is creating a problem can't solve it, Rhea. You just can't solve this problem with the consciousness that's creating it. So let's see if we can somehow invoke a different part of yourself. See, we've got to bring another part of yourself into your life in order to help you cope with her because you can't do it. I just saw it. I mean, I, I wanted to see what the possibilities were for you. <laughs> And, you know, you just, you know, she's your top dog and she beats you up and all you can do is be the underdog. You said, you're right, I'm no good. So has anyone ever protected you in your life? Have you ever felt protected? No, you haven't. That touches something deep in you. What, what does that touch? What, your mother or your father was never there for you in that? What was it like with that? Um, they, um, they're both alcoholics. Yeah. They fight all the time. Um, I don't think they really... How would they treat you? Like a burden. <laughs> I don't think they, either of them really wanted me. Yeah, yeah so there's never been <laughs> anyone there for you at all. Wow. It's tough for me. It's really tough. I can just really feel how painful that is for you. Since we're going to have to, we're going to be like in Disneyland, they have the Imagineers, right? Where, where they try to imagine things. And so we, we've got to imagine a part of you that might be able to help you with this. I'm big into Disney because I got some small kids at home, but are there any fairy tales or anything that's that kind of stood out to you in your life with um, I, like especially a fairy tale with a fairy godmother or what Wizard of Oz Wizard of Oz what did you like about the Wizard of Oz Glenda the Good Witch Glenda the Good Witch yes <laughs> I remember her right she helped Dorothy didn't she she did yeah. she gave Dorothy the slippers from the <laughs> yeah. right the the witch where the house fell on, right? <laughs> so tell me about Glenda. What did you like about her? 
um, she watches over Dorothy and um, she keeps her safe and yes. makes her feel loved and um, yes. she's empathetic towards Dorothy and oh, boy, I can happy. See, see why that stood out for you, huh? If only you had that in your life, right? Someone that thought of you that way. Guess what? We're going to try to bring that into your life right now. I know. Hey, I'm like, what is that about? All right, so I'm going to have you stand up for a minute. So just stand up for a second. But I want you to stand over here. I want you to face this part of you that's been beat up and abused by this other part of you. Okay, so you're going to be cleansed for a minute. Okay. And so start out by just becoming Glenda for a second. So you're going to introduce yourself to me. Say, I'm Glenda the Good Witch. Tell me about yourself. Start out that way. I'm Glenda. I'm Glenda mm -hmm. the Good Witch. What do you do, Glenda? What's your job in life? Um, I watch over kids that are lost. Are lost, right. Well, guess what, Glenda? We have a kid that's lost here with us today, don't we? Rhea over here really needs you. Doesn't you? Okay. What can you say to Rhea to help her deal with this part of her? That's just, you know, ruthless and merciless and just tearing her apart. What can you say to Rhea? I want you to reach out to her if you can. Can you do that with your arms? Reach out to Rhea. Hi, Rhea. I'm Glenda, the Good Witch, and I'm here to protect you. So anytime that you feel negative or you feel... And anytime that she starts to come after you. So oh. are you protecting her from that part? Oh, right, right. Anytime that she uh, comes after you, I'm going to be here for you. And I'm going to push her away. I'm going to make sure you feel safe. Say that to her. I'm going to make sure that you feel safe. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you. Say all that to her again. I'm going to make sure you feel safe and I'm here to protect you. I'm going to make sure that you feel safe and I'm going to protect you. Okay, so sit down now. Be Rhea and respond to Glenda. Um, Can you take that in, Rhea? I'm, uh, I'm scared, uh, but, and I don't know how you're going to protect me. You say that to her. How are you going to protect me? How, how are you going to protect me? Get back here now. Be Glenda again. Miss mm -hmm. Face it. Tell um, her how you're going to protect me. Uh, every time that she says something mean to you or says something awful, I'm going to be there to push that away and tell you something nice and truthful about you, something that's positive. So let's go a step further. Say, let me show you how I'm going to do that. Say that to her. Let me show you how I'm going to do that. Now turn here, come over here and face this part of her. What do you want to do to that part? You don't belong in Rhea's life anymore. And I am here to protect her because she can't have a good life with, she can't have a good life with you still in it, trying to constantly negate everything that she does. So, um, I'm going to push you away. Wrong. Say everything you're saying is wrong. Everything that you're saying about Rhea is wrong. Just like her parents were wrong with how they treated her. Say that too. <laughs> everything that you're saying about Rhea is wrong. Just like what her parents said was wrong. They were not being good parents. Say that. They were not being good parents when they said those things to her. They were not being good parents when they were saying those things to her. And I'm not going to let you keep hurting her like that. 
And I'm not going to let you keep hurting her like that. Put up those arms like you're stopping her. Say it again. I'm not going to. I'm not going to let you hurt her like that anymore. Okay, now come back here and face Rhea again. So say, that's how I'm going to protect you. That's how I'm going to protect you. Okay, now sit there. Be Rhea. Okay. Look up at Glenda again. Do you feel safer right now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm calmer. A little calmer. Yes, that's it. calm is good, right? Because I don't think there's a lot of calmness inside of you at all in your life. Yeah. I feel, I feel lighter. Yeah. Would you thank Glenda for protecting you? Can you thank her? Thank you, Glenda, for being there for me. And um, thank you for continuing or to be there for me. Okay, be Glenda again now and answer. I'm over here. That's that's what I'm here for. And I will always, always be there for you. Can I stand here? Do you have anything to say to Rhea now? Oh, yeah. the, the bad one? Yeah, yeah, the harsh part. Uh, Ask her what she thinks about what you're doing. What do you think about me being in Rhea's life? Let's sit down and answer. I'm not happy about it. Um, not at all, right? No. You used to have in your way with her, aren't you? Always. I've always been in good yeah. Just like her mom and dad had their way with her. Nobody ever protected Rhea. And you're really her mom and dad's voice that's now becomes Rhea's voice. Right. And that part that Glenda is telling you that those days are over now. Yeah. Yeah. And you won't like it. You'll try everything you can to sabotage this. I know you will. So come on, be Glenda one more time. So I want to say something. You Glenda, she's going to try to sabotage this. She's going to try to work around you. She's going to try to find angles. She's going to wait. Your job is, no matter what she does, is to stand up for Rhea. No matter what. So say, no matter what you try to do, I'm not going to let you get to Rhea. No matter what you're going to try to do, I'm never going to let you get close to Rhea again. And if you don't know how to stop her, that's where you can use me. When you're going to meetings, that's where you can use the meetings to help you learn how to shut this down. Because if you shut this down, Rhea's got a chance. Rhea's got no chance if this part continues to do what it's doing to her. All right, now you sit down and be Rhea for a second. Well, wow. What did all that mean to you? Huh? It's a lot to it's take in. a lot in. to take in. I, yeah. thought, I was thinking that as we're doing it, it's like, wow. There's so much here and, and look, it's going to take a lot of practice of this. This isn't going to just turn around now because this is a whole lifetime of doing this, right? Right. And it's going to feel very unfamiliar to be supporting yourself this way. But this insanity doesn't have to keep going on, Rhea. It can stop here. But you need this part of you that you're going to have to imagine. So you might go home. And even create a vision board with mm -hmm. what that Glenda looks like and have words and stuff so that you can use that as a source of that support. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Good Thank work. you. You're welcome. As you saw in that session with Rhea, I tried to see if there was some part of Rhea that I could mobilize, activate to deal with this harsh, these harsh interjections that she's now internalized from her parents. Well, unfortunately, and this is the problem that Rhea's had, is there was no possibility for her to stand up for herself and to take those that other part of her on. 
So it came to me that we were talking about it is that, my goodness, she needs a good fairy in her life, right? Somebody that could come in her life and, and help her realize a possibility that she could not imagine. And that's what I did. I introduced the idea of trying to find a Disney fairy godmother, since I have little kids watching a lot of Disney right now. But she went to the Wizard of Oz. And that's really appropriate, right? Because Glenda, the good witch, took on the evil witches, right? The wicked witches. And that's what she really had to do, is to take on this side of her that was so wicked. And so this began a whole new process for her. And if Rhea continues to nurture and nourish that side of her, that Glenda side, that, that wasn't there, right? Because of course it wouldn't be. There was nobody that she could emulate to be that way with herself. If she can give that to herself, she can give herself a whole new life and really be able to support her recovery. I think that we made some huge steps in that direction today. All right, let me turn my camera back on here. Well, um, it's a very, very, very powerful session. Um, the, the trauma was incredible that this uh, woman had. Um, this was actually a, a simulation of a session that actually occurred when I was running a retreat in um, at the Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation. They have a program called The Lodge, and every year I have a weekend retreat on emotional sobriety. And this one client came up on Saturday nights. I usually create a space where I invite people to come up and work with me. And this one woman came up and and that's where this the, the clinical demonstration of simulation came from. And as the woman started to talk about what was going on, this, this side of her that was just ruthless and beating her up. And as she shared her history later on after we did the work, is that both parents were alcoholic. And from the age of four, until she was um, until she was taken into foster homes at 16, the parents were both physically and verbally abusive. I mean, just, I mean, it was ruthless the way they treated her. When she was 12, her father left um, her and her sister and mother. And from 12 until 16 years old, I believe it was, she was with her mother and the mother would just say to her, you've ruined my life. Um, the reason he left was because of you guys, you know, you're terrible. No one's ever going to love you. You know, all of these such harsh messages is that she totally internalized and that's in Gestalt therapy. We call those introjections. And when I had her try to challenge the part of her that was sending all these messages, there was nothing available. And so that's when I came up and I told her that we had to try to find something that some part of herself that could protect her. And there was nothing there. So I really had to try to help her discover a new possibility, a new possibility with herself and how she was dealing with this problem. And so she shared with me that that she really loved Glenda the Good Witch. And you can see why. I mean, Glenda the Good Witch really captured all of the essence that was missing from her experience with her mother and with her father. Is that real concern about her and her well-being and looking out for her, helping her when she's lost, having empathy? I mean, all of the things that you heard Rhea, in this case, share. And um, it was very hard for her to imagine that. And so, because there was a group around me, talk in terms of turning to resources, I asked her if she could look out in the group. And so, this, this what we call chair work, turned into a psychodrama where I says, well, can you find someone in the audience that could play Glenda, the good witch? And she did. I it was it was almost one of those you know, moments of synchronicity, right? Where it's like Providence was moving. There was this woman in the audience that could have doubled for Glenda the Good Witch. Uh, it was amazing, and and she saw that woman and she had her come up, and this woman played Glenda, and and as this work was taking place, 
all of us were crying. I mean, it was so magical what was happening and what was taking place and inspiring because we saw this woman who was just torn to pieces, starting to put herself back together. And this woman played Glenda and then she changed places and then she played Glenda and the woman played her. And it was just an incredible experience. But I just want to show you this is that how you can bring creativity into a session and now start to discover some new ways of having that person relate to themselves and to the problem. Now, the other thing that you saw me do is I really quickly in the session asked her to separate herself from that critical side of herself. Well, what's the, the, the idea behind that? How come that, that that's a good idea? Well, when a person says, I'm no good, now they fuse themselves with the side of them that's being critical. And when you say I'm no good, there's no room for any new possibility. So when I say, well, let's think about it is there's a side of you telling you're no good, you're no good, and your job is to deal with that side. As soon as I do that, I redefine the problem that the person's experiencing into a situation where there can be new possibilities discovered. That space between themselves and that critical self, between what I would call, you know, in this case, Rhea and her critical self, that space in between those two or that space between who we are and the side of us that's, that's, that's trying to destroy us, that space between the two is that is just fertile ground to discover those new possibilities. And so that's why I try to get those, those, that person separated. So if a person comes in and says, I got a drinking problem, I say, you've got a part of you, you that tells you to drink, whether it's a good idea or not. They come in and say, I'm depressed. There's a part of you making you depressed that you don't know what to do with. So I'm always looking to create that space between the person and that other part of themselves. Because in that space is going to be where a person can discover some new possibilities. And I think you saw that. And so then now the work was, once I discovered what the working point was, was the working point was, is that she had no way to support herself against this this, this, you know, this side of her that was critical and, and just tearing her apart, that now the issue became was is trying to discover some ways to give her support, um, which in this case happened by bringing in Glenda the Good Witch. Um, so I hope that demonstrates to you and you can see in that um, some possibilities in terms of your work with people. Um, I always have some extra chairs in my office because I like to use a lot of chair work with people. You know, now that we're in this Zoom environment, you know, um, sometimes I'll have people pull chairs up when I'm talking to them over Zoom. You know, you can also do this by just having them do what's called voice dialogue. That was a variation on Gestalt therapy that was developed by, I can't remember their, their names right now but they called it uh, voice dialogue right and they did this parts work with voices and so you can have a person play one voice and be the voice of that other part and then change and be the voice of of the part that they're in dialogue with but the reason that we're externalizing this conflict and not just talking about it so that's the other thing that i want you to pay attention to you could see that i wanted to quickly move from talking about the problem she was having to having her experience what was going on. Because it's in the experiencing of it, in the enactment of what she's struggling with, that she's going to have a first and very personal experience with dealing with it in hopefully a different way. And as she deals with it, she feels what happens when she becomes Glenda. She feels what happens when she's sitting there and Rhea's talking back to her. I want her to have those experiences. She feels what that critical self is doing to her. That makes the therapy much more powerful and the experience much more compelling. 
So um, there are two questions. Go ahead, Keith, you wanna ask them at this point? Sure. So from Barbara Marcus, she asks, since the harsh part of her was still a part of her, why couldn't the protective part of her still be part of her as well, instead of calling her Glenda? Couldn't it instead have just been called the protective part in her, or sometimes we talk about inner child? Yes, I, she chose the word, she chose Glenda. So Glenda is going to be that part of her, and maybe at some point in time, she'll drop that term. But I liked it that her using the word Glenda because it had so much connection to the experience she had when she saw Glenda in the movie. So to me, that was what we call a projection of the part of her that was possible, that could possibly pr protect herself. You see, we don't need a, a parent to install that. We all have a protective part of us that's built into us biologically. You know, our immune system protects us, but it, we also protect ourselves in all kinds of ways. The way that that part doesn't get integrated into personality is when we have experiences like she had that blocks it. So it's not like I was now bringing that part to her. I said I were installing it. Really, it would have been more accurate to say what I'm doing is helping her rediscover that part of her. And so now when she rediscovers that possibility and she sees that, because before all of that possibility was just projected into Glenda because it wasn't a possibility in the family that she was growing up with. So yeah, you could have done that if that would have felt like more, you know, a better way to go for you. There would have been nothing wrong with that. I just like to keep it connected to the fantasy that she had because that seemed to be the projection of that, of, of who she, that part of her that she could never integrate into her personality. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question to that from Morgan Joins is, would you have given her a name to name the negative part as well? Uh, I called it the critical self. You know, sometimes, usually I go with what the client names it as, and if the client doesn't have a name, I might suggest something. If they like it, they take that on. I called it the critical self. We kind of went with that. I could have called it the abusive self. You know, the, sh the should monsters, uh, I've heard people refer to it as. Once again, I think that in, um, whatever label I go ahead and put on it, I want it to be something that the client feels comfortable in using and identifying with. Later on, I went ahead and suggested that the critical self was really her parents' voice. So maybe at some point later on in the therapy, I would want her to start hearing that side speaking in her parent, in her mom's voice, in her dad's voice to get even further distance from it. That's where the therapy might go in the future sessions. Great, thank you. Another question from Melissa Miller. Would you be willing to share images of the smart things to do and the stupid things poster? Oh, uh, share those images, meaning um, like in a PDF file? Is that what they're asking for, Keith, or did I miss that? Yeah, they didn't say. I don't know if it's whether it's on this presentation or a PDF, but would you be able to do either? Okay, well, yeah, I could share those. If you send me an email, I can share them with you. I can I can talk about what's on those things. Is I've, I've written two books with Hazleton. One was the first book I wrote for Hazleton, which has become a bestseller, which is 12 Stupid Things That Mess Up Recovery. And in that book, I look at what I consider some of the common things that a person does in the first couple of years of their life that undermine their recovery and what they need to do to be aware of that and to, and to deal with those things. So it's, it's things like putting less energy into your recovery than you put into going out and getting high and, or drinking. And that's a common mistake that people make is that they think they could come into reco recovery and kind of cruise. But boy, you know, we sure weren't cruising when we were our addiction was active. I know I would go to any length to get high and to, to do what I could do. Obviously, I'm in recovery myself, 
Um, but that's one of the things that I saw is that those people that came in the program and went after the program with the same zeal that they had when they were drinking and using are the people that did quite well. So that's what I, that was in what the, some of the things that we talked about in 12 Stupid Things and 12 Smart Things. I looked at the other side of the coin is that what do you have to do to take better care of yourself? And I really built on the idea that Bill Wilson had about emotional sobriety. And emotional sobriety is about dealing with our emotional dependency. And what that means, the emotional dependency is, is that um, in Gestalt therapy, we call it that maturation is the transcendence of environmental support to self-support. So emotional dependency is when I'm counting on my environment to support me. So I look to you for validation. I look to you for approval. My self-esteem is dependent on how what you think about me, how you're feeling, what's going on with you. Or my self-esteem is contingent upon those things that, that are happening in my life, but they're not dependent on what I do. And emotional sobriety is where we become the determining force in our life, and which I would describe as being self-supportive, not self-sufficient, but self-supportive because no one is self-sufficient. We need each other. We need our environment to, to live and to, and to sustain ourselves. If somebody took away all the oxygen from the room that we're in right now, we'd all be in great trouble. We need that oxygen, but I need to participate to get it. What do I need to do? I need to inhale and exhale. I, I need to participate in order to take what's in, in around me in my environment. I need to take it in so that it can nourish me and sustain me and that's true with all of life and so in gestalt therapy we're constantly looking at that contact boundary well we can see for Rhea that contact boundary is a mess she makes contact and she can't support herself she doesn't feel worthy of asking for what she wants she doesn't feel worthy of supporting herself in recovery you know she's continuing to live with all of these and, and um, Dr. Mary and Robert Goulding called it living with all these injunctions that came out of transactional analysis. An injunction is don't be happy, don't be sane, don't, don't live a great life. That's all the stuff that Rio was, was manifesting. So in 12 Smart Things, I start on, on looking at some of these things like owning your projections, you know, becoming aware of your emotional dependency. They're really great resources. And recently those two books have been put on audio books. So they're also available on Amazon on audio. But if you like the uh, images of those, I've got them somewhere. If you send me an email, abphd at uh, msn.com, that's abphd at msn.com, then I can go ahead and, and send you those. Yes, yeah, so Melissa had said a PDF would be fine. That She sees the posters in the background. Yes. Um, so she says perhaps they would be useful and fun for clients. Yes, we can definitely get you those. Okay. Awesome. And then from uh, Shamin Sufi, how is your approach different from the internal family systems approach, which uses parts? I think that there's a lot of overlap. I, I'm not that familiar in, with internal family systems, but I do think that that was an, um, an offshoot of Gestalt therapy. So for the, the 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 so I couldn't really articulate that. If if you know the uh, internal family systems, you could probably talk a, a lot about the difference in, in it. I know for in the, this approach, Gestalt therapy is very much grounded in having faith in what we call our organismic wisdom. You see that, that we are all wired, and I don't know if internal family systems has this kind of um, these roots in this kind of an idea, but let me talk about it. You see that we're all wired to move towards our wholeness. Uh, it just happens automatically. Um, like I said in the in the video, I have um, two children. I've got Maddie right now, who's seven. I've got four children, actually two older children that are adults, but I got two little ones, a seven-year-old and a two-year-old, and so Maddie's seven and Cece's two. So it, it's been amazing watching Cece go through her development, and it just reminds me of this process that's inside of us. I did not have to tell Cece to turn from her stomach to her back. We put her on her stomach, 
and she would automatically want to turn to her back. She wanted more mobility. She wanted to move towards that possibility. After she started to get that down, when she was on her stomach, she'd start pushing herself up on her hands and knees. And what was she doing? She was developing some core strength. And she's developing that core strength so that she could start to crawl. And then pretty soon she would start to do this rocking motion. And at other times she'd even do the downward dog. I don't know if you've seen little kids do that, but it's amazing. They do a downward dog version. All along trying to develop the strength and the coordination, the cerebellum is starting to coordinate all these muscles to flex and to relax and so that she can start to coordinate her movements. Well, once she gets to crawling down and they can, God, they can crawl fast, those kids. The next thing is, is to pull herself up, right? Go next to a coffee table and grab hold of the coffee table and pull herself up to a standing position. She wants to walk. Now, my wife and I weren't standing there saying, look, Cece, it's time to figure this out now. Come on, get it, pull yourself up. That desire to move towards that possibility is hardwired inside of her, just like it's hardwired inside of her to learn language, to master her life, her experiences. So she wants to be what she can be. That force is alive and well in all of us. She'd pull herself up to the table. She'd start letting go so she could learn how to balance herself in a three-dimensional space, in a three-dimensional plane, and then she'd fall. And what would she do? She'd pick herself up and do it again. Now, the difference between Cece and us is we have in our mind some idea of how many times we're supposed to fall before we get it figured out. Well, she doesn't. She's going to get up and fall and pull herself back up as many times as she needs to. That's what determines it is as many times as she needs to do it. She doesn't have these rules in her head that we have about what you're supposed to do. So then the next thing is, is after she starts to stand and gets balanced, what does she try to do? Take a step. And what happens when she takes a step? She loses her balance and falls. And then she gets up, she does it again. And she keeps doing it and she's learning through her mistakes. She's taking the information she's had from making mistakes and she's plugging it into her life and she's continuing to move towards what she can be. Well, look, we're gonna do that same thing across the board. We all have different parts of ourselves. Some of them come from our family, some of them I make up for myself, and some of them come from my society. But if I don't have these supposed to's in my life, I'm going to integrate all these parts so that they are joint contributors to my wholeness. See, in Gestalt therapy, we define mental health as an appropriate balance and coordination of all that we are. That's what mental health is. So if I didn't have these shoulds in my mind, I would take the angry part of me, I would take this other part of me, and they would all start to get integrated into a whole personality so that my behavior wouldn't be fixed. The other thing that we say is you can tell how healthy a person is by the degree to which that person allows themselves to be controlled by a situation. If I allow myself to be controlled by the situation, meaning that I take in what's happening in any situation I'm at, and then I process that in terms of now making contact with that situation, a way to take care of myself. If I let myself be controlled, then I'm going to be able to best take care of myself in that situation. Whereas if I come in with a fixed behavior, now I'm gonna impose my demands on that situation instead of being able to respond to the demands of that situation. That's what mental health looks like. That's what emotional sobriety looks like. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I sure did enjoy the kind of answer I gave <laughs> you. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. And it does seem similar. It does. Uh, we have another question from Alejandra Iturbi Mendez. She says, creativity belongs everywhere. Would you say that creativity in the therapeutic process is up to the creative human capacity to be able to affect change and that it includes a process that involves shifts in the thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and perspectives. 
I, I think you're right on what you're saying. I agree with it 100%. I think, unfortunately, today we are taking creativity out of the scene by generating all these protocols. And and people talk about evidence-based practice where people think that this is a, this is the model, this is the agenda, this is what I'm going to bring to the session, instead of allowing a person's problem to determine how we're going to deal with it. So I think, unfortunately, some schools of therapy right now are taking us out and we're becoming technicians. And it's a big concern I have about where training's going. I really think that, you know, I'm very, very uh, grateful and appreciative that I was encouraged to use myself to the degree that I can today. So that's where I find the, the work to be incredibly stimulating. I think that we are creative beings. I think that our ability to creatively adapt and to deal with situations, even what she came up with is that, you know, she survived that hell that she grew up with in terms of this case example that I just shared with you, is by becoming that harsh voice herself, is she found a way to get through that. That's one way that she adapted to the situation. Because if she had anything else, she'd be too raw. So it's amazing that all of these, these symptoms we develop, these survival responses to situations we have, our ability to cope and to find unbelievable solutions to incredibly you know, painful and difficult situations just continues to amaze me. So you're right on. I think it's such an important part of who we are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. And we'll just give another minute for other questions and then we can move on. Anything else that you wanted to say before you wrap up, if there are no other questions? No. Um, I um, There's a couple more slides that I just can show people real quick. So here's a Great. few tips. I just want you to think about listening to what the client is not saying. And what I mean by this is that it's what the client is not saying that gives you a clue about what's needed. So Rhea could not support herself. She could not say something supportive to herself. That's what she didn't say. And that told me everything about what I needed to hear. I always am looking for what is the polar opposite of what is going on right now, because that's also going to give me a clue to what is needed. What would you dare not say to the client? Ask yourself that. And then if you come up with something, ask permission if you can share it. Sometimes have the client take the undeveloped position. You kind of saw that in terms of the undeveloped position in this point was the protector. Ask permission before you say something that might be difficult for the patient or family to accept. Is once you bring them in and, and develop an attitude of collaboration, it's amazing how powerful the things that you can say that you're hesitant to say can be in terms of helping somebody turn things around and becoming aware of something. Create experiments, you know, get them to enact what's going on, not just talk about it. Sometimes we can exaggerate what is. You saw me trying to do some of those things by say this, say that again, say it this way. Those were some of the things I did. We're going to lean into the resistance. We're not going to try to oppose it, but we're going to go with the resistance and gestalt therapy and never assume that you know how your client responded to your session. Debrief before ending your session. So I'll just give a shout out for what we call practice-based evidence instead of evidence-based practice. People like uh, Barry Duncan, Scott Miller have done a lot of research on what happens when we're actually in session with clients. And what they found was that the client's perception of the therapeutic alliance explained the most variance in terms of outcome of therapy. So what that means is if a client feels like you understand them, if they feel like they got a chance to talk about what was important to them, that they felt like you were a good fit, um, those dimensions become very important. And so you can find out by just asking someone at the end of the session, how did you find this session? And please, I want to know if, if you felt like it wasn't a good fit today, or if you didn't get to talk about it. 
you know, sometimes somebody will say to you, like, you know, I think you just talk too much or you didn't give me enough feedback. Well, listen to them. They're asking you for something and see what you can do to respond to that. Because what we find is that the best therapists are the ones that take feedback from their clients, especially when the clients feel like they're not getting what they need out of therapy and they integrate what's missing back into the sessions. So I'll leave you with this. The creative therapist is a disciplined craftsman whose gift is a reaching out toward his most profound potential. It is this practicing with love and stretching beyond himself without stereotypic shallow self-seeking and righteousness that has the makings of a creative person and a creative therapist. Here is my email address. This is where you can reach me at if you have any questions. I have a lot of, uh, the, in fact, I'm going to be um, making available a DVD with a bunch of clinical demonstrations and stuff that you can use with clients and to show them and to talk about them. And that should be out and available for sale in about a month from now. We've just released a new DVD on emotional sobriety, all my books. I've got a bunch of audio tapes and some of which are also available on Amazon. So Keith, thank you so much. Let me stop sharing my screen. And how do I go back now? Is that's leaving.